The Retirement Cafe podcast. Is resilience the key to a happier retirement? Hello and welcome to another episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast with me, your host, Justin King. If you're thinking about your retirement or already retired, you're in the right place. My aim is to help you plan for and live a successful and meaningful retirement. Retirement is far more than just a financial event. It's a significant life event, a major transition, which will bring with it new challenges and opportunities. So each episode contains tips, information and inspiration to help you feel more informed and confident about your retirement. I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome to another episode. Today I want to share the story and triumphs of a man who has turned struggle into strength and used his personal experiences to help others do the same. From the rugby pitch to the battlefield, from breaking Guinness World Records to coaching Paralympic athletes, James Elliott is a psychotherapist and resilience coach who is on a mission to empower minds. In my conversation with James, we chat about the wealth of knowledge and experience that James has accumulated over the years and how his book, Think Yourself Resilient, Harness Your Emotions, Build Confidence, Transform Your Life, can unravel the secrets behind mental resilience and coping strategies. His five pillars of mental resilience could be the key to a happier retirement. Without further ado, here's James telling his inspiring story. So welcome to the Retirement Cafe podcast, James Elliott. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Ah, We're really looking forward to our chat today, James. Um, For those who don't know you, uh, we're going to find out all about you today and what you do. But for those who don't know you, tell me a little bit about yourself. So I'm a psychotherapist, but I specialize in development of resilience. So I'm actually ex-military. So I did 14 years in the Airborne Forces. So I spent 14 years as a British Army paratrooper. Um, And now I have my own brand, my own sort of virtual clinic in which I work. I tend to work with very, very, very high-performing individuals or very vulnerable veterans. So I kind of sit in there. So I work with a lot of athletes. I work with a lot of um, Olympians, Paralympians, professional fighters, rugby players, CEOs, um, even people in the political world. And then on the other side, I do lots of like really fascinating, fulfilling work, working with like very vulnerable veterans, guys who I served operationally with or who served operations before me. And we have lots of meaningful conversations and help them um, um, find a sense of meaning and purpose. Wow. Wow. Now, obviously, um, working with sports people, working with military people, um, these are people who kind of retire early. <laughs> you know, point, yeah. not, they, yeah. they don't they don't hit they don't hit sixty five and go. You know, right? I get my gold clock and um, mm. you know and walk off into the sunset. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, this this kind of this is a different world to maybe a lot of the people listening to the podcast. Mm. Uh, you know, traditional retirement age. Um, you know, how does um, how does that exiting, you know, the 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 you know being the top of a sports career or maybe in the top of the exit in military career at a relatively young age, how how do people cope with that? I think that's really interesting. So first and foremost, yeah, I want to talk about the military side of things because identity is massive in the military because you are defined by the colour of your beret, the badges on your arm, the cap badge you might have. You, the belt that you wear, the stripes on your chest, all of those types of things uh, contribute towards your sense of identity. And that purpose is provided to you by the regiment. So if you're a, uh, an infantry unit, it would be to close in with and, uh, uh, and, and, and kill the enemy. You know, gunnery is to provide close gunnery support, engineers, engineering support. So all of this, your, your, your unit has a mission statement and your identity is that of your unit and its mission statement. Really interesting because then what happens when guys leave or retire from the military and you retire is sometimes a strong case um, to, to say because people do four years and then leave. People who do 22 years, they are retiring from the military. And when they retire, they lose their sense of identity. We're asking you to no longer be, if you've done 22 years, and chances are it's Sergeant Major, 
you are no longer asking you to be Sergeant Major Smith of the Parachute Regiment. We're asking you to be Mark. And a lot of people don't know who that is. One of the things that I work with, with the guys who are actually still serving, is I say, one of the most powerful things you can do to assist you in that change of identity is develop a sense of who you are outside of the uniform whilst you're still in the uniform. Mm. So for me, I did some strength conditioning coaching at a National League rugby club. I had to take some time from work and I got to do that. And that opened up coaching and mentoring to me. And I realized how powerful that was and how much I enjoyed that. So I did that. And I've realized just how powerful that is. Now I encourage those to find a sense of who you are outside. So when you transition from serving to civilian, you find out who you are. Most people don't really know who they are because the military does everything. How you eat, how you sleep, how you drink, who your friends are. Everything about the way that you carry yourself, you live your life is dictated to you. And that's really important because that almost guarantees success. When a young recruit walks through the main gate, the first thing they do is they shave his head and give him a number. First thing they do, I walk through, shave my head. You are 25201522, recruit Elliot. I finished 25201522, my final day of service with the reserves, 25201522, Corporal Elliot. That you are that is every every form, every ID card, every thing in the army, name, rank, number. That is who mm. you are. And so that becomes your sense of identity. When you're a recruit, if you walk like a successful recruit, so you march around camp like a successful recruit, if you wear your uniform, iron your uniform, if you sleep the right amount, if you eat the right food, if you sit with the right people, you use the right language. All of that becomes your identity. And rather than setting the goal of passing basic training, if you challenge someone's identity, they're far more likely to be successful. Rather than constantly trying to strive towards a goal, if you make an individual's identity that of what they want to become, they're far more likely to become it. People who have been millionaires who have then become bankrupt are far more likely to become millionaires again. It's their identity already. They know all the tricks. They know how to do everything. Athletes, it's the same. My my, my fighters, every single thing that they do is about becoming a better fighter, what they eat, how they drink, where they sleep. I work with the Paralympic rowing team. It is their identity. They are Paralympic rowers, and every single thing that they do is about becoming a Paralympic rower. I don't care for goal setting. I don't care for smart principles. It doesn't mean anything. It's not, it's not true to life. So your identity becomes this thing. Now, particularly in the military, that is reinforced time and time and time again. Because the more you enact that identity, the more it's positively reinforced. The more you act like a professional soldier, the more leadership courses you're sent on. Therefore, they promote you. Therefore, they pay you more. Therefore, you get more respect within your regiment. Then you become a corporal. And then you become a, well, a lance corporal or a lance, a lance bombardier or whatever it might be. And then you become a corporal. Then you become a sergeant. Now you're considered a senior. And that behavior of being of that identity is constantly being reinforced. Well done, well done, well done, well done. Here's another badge. Here's another badge. Here's another accolade. Here's a special coin. Here's a medal. Here's a piece of paper saying, commendation, well done. And then it gets to the end of the service. And, well, who is that person? Without the coins, without the medals, without the certificates, without the uniform, without the beret. That's why on so many parades, you will see veterans in a suit, medal, wearing their beret. Because it's still so much a part of who they are. Mm. So one of the most powerful things that any any soldier or anyone facing retirement can do, particularly when their job is a vocational job that absorbs so much of their time and space outside of their actual normal work, working hours, is find out who you are outside of that. Develop a really strong sense of self outside. I knew I was going to be a psychotherapist and resilience coach. I'd already started taking gigs. I'd already started doing talks. I'd already started working with people. So when I came to leave, it was a much smoother transition. And I transitioned during COVID-19. One day I was wearing uniform, the next day I wasn't. I had a phone call from my regiment because I was working with Army Headquarters and Mental Health Team, so I was on a posting when I, when I left, when I, when I terminated my service. I had a phone call from my regiment said, uh, Jim, we're expecting you in the regiment on Monday. It was actually one of my mates who I 
served with who he just picked up his sergeant and said, Jim, I've got a note here saying that you're back here on Monday. What's going on? I said, I'm not, mate. I'm out of the army on Thursday. I said, I've got a note saying you've got to be. So I rang, rang, the, rang the RSM and he said, mate, you've got to come and see us. I came in. He said, when's your actual last day in the army? I went, Thursday. I don't have any uniform. I've had my final medical. And he was like, because of COVID-19, I had had none of the transition, none of the workshops, none of the easing from one to the other. I literally had my uniform on, took my uniform off and never wore it. Mm. And that was like really bizarre. And I think, oh, there must have been so many soldiers within that period of time who, because of COVID-19, never got to transition properly and were left massively in the lurch. So developing a sense of identity whilst you're in a job that's so vocational is really important. And that's really then hard to do that with athletes. Because the moment you start talking to an athlete about what you're going to do outside of competing, you're taking their mind away from competing. And competing has to be, that has to be the end goal. It's not like the military whereby you've got a couple of years at the end and there's down times where you can develop this sense of identity. An athlete tends to be very intense, four, five, six year point. Okay, you might have longevity in your career. You might be a professional footballer. Again, like there's nuance to that because you, you should have enough financial security when you leave to be okay. Like as long as you've invested that intelligently, but that's not my job to talk about that. Um, I don't give people financial advice. I, I don't know. I'm not a banker, but the, um, but with so, some of these, you know, uh, um, fighters, for example, it's not a particularly a long career. Rugby guys, it's not necessarily a long career. If you're still playing rugby in your forties, that's really what a professional competing would be. That's really strange. So it's a very short period of time. So they focus entirely on that. And then we have to do quite a quick transition piece, quite a quick, if you're not going to do that, what are you going to do? Because not all, in fact, very me- not, not very many athletes actually want to then go into coaching. Very few athletes, when they go up the ladder, they want to come back down it. Very few athletes, when they've competed at first team level, and the first team might be championship or Premier League or National League One, very rarely do they then want to take a step down into the second team and, even less likely to take a step down into a third team. They don't want to do that, which is some of them do, some do. That's not true of all of them. Of course, every individual you meet is an exception to the rule, but the vast majority of them don't want to do that. So you have to then help them find a sense of who and what they are. And not all of them want to go into coaching. So it could be really challenging. Developing that sense of identity. If you're in a job and you're looking at retirement and you know you're going to retire in 10 years, you know you're going to retire in five years, start developing a sense of who you are outside of that work. Because so many people leave that. And once you've lost that sense of purpose and you've lost that identity, that could be extremely disarming and generate a huge amount of emotional distress because people are, who am I? No, but who actually am I? And we particularly see that in, um, in, in veterans and blue life services as well. People work for the NHS for 30, 40 years, people who are paramedics, people who are police officers, people who are firefighters. Once they leave, who are they? And that's an extremely challenging question. It's almost unfair because a person will say, I don't know, but how am I supposed to know? So then you have to help them develop that sense of identity. And that could be come from loads of different things. And identity and fulfillment tend to be quite closely linked. Alfred Adler, who said, the key to fulfillment is finding what you are good at and using that to benefit the community. If you've been an electrical engineer working for BMW for 30 years, and then you don't really know what it is you're going to do next, but you know that you're really good with a a spanner and screwdriver and making things and mechanical stuff, and you really like helping your local community, next thing you know, those guys are walking into jobs in bike shops. And they're helping their community to get on bikes and be more green and be more active. And they're loving it. And you're helping them find that sense of purpose, that sense of identity. It's the same in in all aspects, find out what it is that actually you really enjoy doing and how are you using that to benefit your community? Because that's a wonderful way of finding your your sense of fulfillment and your identity, using your passion to help people. To add on to that, Pablo Picasso says that the meaning of life is to find your gift, but the purpose of life is to give that gift away. When you leave your, your work and you go into retirement and you have that space and you have that time, you have that opportunity, find out what it is that you're good at, find out what it is that you love and give it away. And that's really helpful. And that's what I do a lot with soldiers. What did you enjoy doing? Well, do you know what? When I was adventure training and I was a mountain leader and I got to take guys up and down a mountain, I love that. Cool. Let's build a future identity based around that. Go be an adventure training instructor. You've got two years now before you're out of the army. 
get your canoeing instructors, get your abseiling instructors, get your mountain instructor, mountain leader, go and get those courses done and then develop that sense of identity whilst you're in uniform so that when the time comes to take that uniform off, you know who you are, you know what direction, what it is you want to do. Similar, but much harder to do with the high performing athletes because the intensity of which they have to perform means that they have to be focused on that. So that can be much more challenging for the high performing athlete. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you know, for the for the response, which I'm sure you must get sometimes, it's which is, you know, my whole life is consumed with mm. my sport. You know, mm. I'm eating, breathing, drinking it. You know, th this is my life. And what interest do you have outside? Well, you know, maybe, maybe you don't, mm. you know, and I do, I've, you know, I've talked to high performing executives, people who, you know, they are consumed in essence by their work. And then to be honest, what spare time they then got is they spent with their family. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the continual complaints have been the, you know, the, the, the family taxi driver and, uh, you know, just, just trying to, you know, uh, sort out their family life. They probably haven't actually left a great deal of time for themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you respond to these people? Well, it's so interesting. So um, I just worked some guys in, in London who, you know, they work six to seven hours a week. <laughs> What's your interest outside of work? Food and sleep mainly. <laughs> yeah. And some of them, I, you know, I, I, I barely see my family. Some of them say I don't have a family. I had to make a choice. You know, am I going to make it as a senior banker? And as a junior banker, you have to put in so many hours. The reality is, is that you're not going to spend any time whatsoever with those people because you have to commit to that. And then it gets to retirement age and they're going, well, what do you want to do? And say, well, I don't know. But there is something beautiful about a clean slate, which is that you can then put anything you want on it. So there does become a beautiful opportunity to explore yourself and explore your personality. You might really love competitive Frisbee. You might do. Like there then becomes a space whereby if you approach this with what an exciting opportunity to try all the things I've always wanted to do, but I've never had the opportunity to, that's a really beautiful space to be in. Try to not be overwhelmed by the choice. And there is a, which just escapes me now, a psychological term for it, like choice overwhelm. Because as human beings can generally speak and handle free choices. Anything more than that, it begins to become emotionally complicated and we don't spend enough time considering certain options. But just saying, right, well, what's something I've always wanted to do? Or actually, what from my childhood did I really enjoy? That's often a good exercise. If people have, you know, quite nurturing childhoods, and again, it does depend on having a nurturing childhood. Individuals who come from quite traumatic and challenging childhoods don't have that same um, uh, privilege. But if people come from like nurturing childhoods where they had things that they really enjoyed and they really remembered, you can say, well, actually, why don't we do our best to recreate that? When were you happiest? Who were you with? And what were you doing as a child? Oh, well, do you know what? Actually, when we used to go swimming, I used to love that. Well, okay, well, let's look at a career based around that. Let's look at something based around that. Let's develop that identity and that fulfillment based around that. But it is undeniably an extremely, extremely challenging um, um, time of anyone's life when they feel like, or indeed not just feel like, they actually are losing their sense of identity. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. So... Um... You know, there's obviously, yes, I, I think, uh, you know, the great work that you're doing there, helping people, you know, through that massive transition in, t in, 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 in life. Um, let's just take a sidestep for a second and tell me a little bit about, um, about your new book, Think Yourself Resilient, Harness Your Emotions, Build Your Confidence and Transform Your Life. I mean, the, the, obviously, this seems to be very connected to what we've just been talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, harness your emotions, build your confidence, transform your life. I can imagine... A lot of people, their feeling at the point of this transition is that actually, you know, um, we are terrified of what the future holds. Um, yeah. And the confidence we may have had in that safe surroundings of the military, safe surroundings of the corporate job, safe surroundings of the, or, you know, when I'm performing, when I'm at my best, I'm on the sports field. Um, mm. And all of a sudden, we're, we're, we're not. And I can imagine only the emotion of kind of, well, probably, probably flipping terrified. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is terrifying. It is, um, it is really overwhelming. Um, so basically the, the book, so um, about three years ago now, I guess the journey with the book started. It took me about three years, all in all, to write. Um, I got picked up by Octopus, who are an amazing, uh, the Thread Books, who are an amazing publishing house, um, who really, really helped and supported me. And kind of the origin for the book was when I finished the Army, I was in the Army Mental Health Training Team, and um, 
we, I was delivering mental resilience training all around the country. And I loved that. I really, really enjoyed it. And um, there were just elements of, once I sort of left and started on my own practice, elements of that mental resilience training that were really pertinent, lots of my own stuff that went in, lots of sort of new revelations. And I realized just how misunderstood the, the concept of resilience was because resilience kind of gets branded as really aggressive, it linked to violence, linked to like tough. But resilience is more about adaptability. And it's more about self-compassion. You get far better results from compassion than than, than you do with um, self-criticism. And it's about understanding your position, understanding where you are. Theodore Roosevelt says, do what you can with what you have wherever you are. Lots of people will sit in absolute abject misery and say, well, it is what it is. And I say, it's not a case of it is what it is. It's a case of it is what I choose to make it. What, where am I? What is my position and what can I do about it? How can I make it that 1% better? How am I spending my time? Who am I spending my time with? Where do I want to go? What's my identity? What do I want to achieve? And what's my doing to achieve it? Saying it is what it is will have you sitting in absolute chaos, surrounded by disaster. Disaster. But instead, it is what I choose to make it will have you moving forward. Have you identifying goals? Have you identifying where it is you want to be? Taking that step. And so that's what the book is about. And I kind of take the concept of resilience and I break it down into sort of different pillars that help you prop up that emotional resilience. We talk about confidence and identity and goals and emotional intelligence and relationships and physical health. Massive part of it, physical health. And again, to tie it back into um, uh, veterans, one of the biggest things we see is really poor physical health terrible terrible health behaviors from from veterans and that's all down to they're, they're losing their identity they no longer have somebody standing over their shoulder shouting at them to go for runs being watching them like a hawk to see what they're going to eat like that goes and there's a lot of social pressure in the military to eat a certain way to look a certain way to train a certain way within particular units that is not in every unit but when that's gone and individuals are left to themselves with, of course, an added element of trauma, with, of course, an added element of a loss of identity and purpose, really negative health behaviors. So that's another aspect of it that's covered in the book. We talk about health behaviors. How are you treating your body in this difficult time, this difficult transition time? Don't add to the cortisol, that stress hormone. Don't add to the cortisol, the stress in your body by eating rubbish food, drinking rubbish drinks, not looking after yourself. Remove that cortisol by sleeping well, by making sure you've got good sleep hygiene, by making sure you're eating the right foods throughout the day, by getting some exercise, going for a walk, going for a swim. You don't have to be training Brazilian jiu-jitsu and pumping iron twice a day, but you do have to start looking after yourself. And that's going to drain cortisol and return your body to a state of homeostasis, particularly your central nervous system. So it's absolutely essential to resilience that we look after our physical health. The development of confidence is very common for people to lose their confidence once they have that retirement and they're no longer doing that thing that they're so good at that has kept them in employment for 20, 30, 40 years and they're no longer doing that. That becomes incredibly challenging because you go, well, not only have I lost my sense of identity, but actually, what am I even good at? That's challenging. Yeah. So we talk about confidence, we talk about goals and identity, and I'm massive on identity to achieve your goals. We talk about emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence, again, like really interesting, that self-awareness, that emotional control, that being aware, that social awareness, being aware of, of the room, that motivation to do something about it. All of those are key factors of um, emotional intelligence. And, of course, your relationships. Relationships are, are absolutely essential. There's a huge amount of this. is a really, really unbelievably brilliant paper. I can't remember the originator, but it was about the Mediterranean diet. And one of the things that was identified in the Mediterranean diet is how much the family get involved in the making of the food and everyone sits together. And so when we talk about the Mediterranean diet being the healthiest, it's not just a case of eating fish and salad. It's actually a case of preparing the food with your family, sitting with your family, having that tight engagement. And much like myself, you might be fairly thin on the ground for family, but you can choose some of those. Choosing your friendship group, going for food with your friends, 
spending time socializing with people who are positive, helpful people, that's so incredibly important. Yeah. And all of those factors affect your mental health. And that's and that's what all goes into my book, Think Yourself Resilient. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, some very wise words there, James, very wise words. Um, and, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to read the book and it's, it, it, is, it is fantastic. Uh, Thank you. Where can, James, where, pick and, um, where can people find out more about you and the great work that you're doing? Well, the book is available on Amazon and um, I, I record it on Audible. So um, I got to go into a studio, which was just the most surreal thing, and sit in a studio and read my book, um, which was amazing. Um, so I'm on social media platforms. So I tend to do Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, I, I struggle enough as it is with those social media platforms, but I'm on there as James Elliott. So please um, find me on there, connect with me on there. And there's my link in bio to my book, to my website with my email address and my, if you want to get hold of me and do some work together, that's absolutely brilliant. That's not a problem. Um, and so, yeah, so my book is available on Amazon and you can get hold of me on LinkedIn or Instagram. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we'll put all of those details in the uh, show notes, all those Thank links. Um, really, really appreciate your time. I know you're ever so busy. Um, thanks once again, James Elliott. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks once again to James for joining me today. I am sure you will agree as an inspiring story, which I hope will prove a helpful way to ensure you get the most from your retirement by building resilience. As ever, if you've enjoyed this episode, please do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does help more people like you find us. And for more interviews and retirement planning videos, you might want to check out my YouTube channel. Just search for Justin underscore King, or you can click in the link in the show notes. And of course, if you want to get in touch with feedback or guest ideas, you can reach me on hello at the retirementcafe.co.uk. So until next time, I'm Justin King, helping you feel more informed in your retirement.